up, we have a, a great talk uh, on remote control ICS. Uh, it will be given by Corey Thune. Corey, we hired him as a senior researcher with Digital Bond Labs. He joined us uh, from working for his own consulting company, South Fork Security. Uh, and he also may be familiar to a lot of you who took the uh, Idaho National Labs uh, red-blue exercises where he was a proctor and researcher for a number of years. Uh, so Corey's been a consultant in the uh, ICS space for the last four years, um, and he'll be presenting on, uh, as I said, remote control ICS. Thanks. Uh, I don't know how to advance the slides, actually. Oh, there it is. All right. Uh, yes, hi, I'm Corey. Um, hopefully, we're going to have a little bit of fun in the next, uh, next half hour. Uh, so this project is uh, remote control ICS slash remote control automobiles. And that slash is actually pretty significant and sort of the central idea of this talk is that uh, um, I, uh, automobiles are critical systems. They're part of our nation's critical infrastructure. They're part of the transportation sector, the roads that they drive on, and the machines themselves. Uh, you're talking about um, control systems that are managing 4,000 pound machines. Uh, that somebody sits in and hurdles themselves down the road, which when you think about it, it's sort of insane. Um, which I guess there's no shocker that uh, 33,000 people uh, plus are killed in the United States alone from owner-operator error of these control systems, uh, control system software failure, or mechanical failure. Uh, that also is trouble. And when you really think about cars in terms of a control system, uh, especially given recent events, you see a lot of parallels uh, to the general ICS space uh, that we're running into. And that's where it's really interesting, and that's sort of the central point that we'll come back to, come back around to as we go here. Uh, but first, we're going to hit a little bit of literature review in terms of vehicle security. Uh, so at Usenix, um, these guys presented some papers. Uh, UW did a bunch of research, partnered with some other people about uh, looking at the security of vehicles. Uh, and they were doing some stuff with T TPS, uh, tire pressure sensors, and uh, it was really cool. Um, probably the most uh, familiar example that everybody's going to know about is these two guys, uh, Charlie Miller, Chris Valasek. They are at uh, uh, IOActive, or Chris is at IOActive. Um, and they had a DARPA-funded project where uh, they were also looking at vehicle security. I don't have any pictures of myself on top of cars. Uh, that would have been really cool, especially Chris Sistrunk should have let me on that green uh, Mustang. I don't know where Chris is at. Oh, hey, let's take a picture after this. I'll lay down on it for you. Um, but what they did was uh, they, were, they did a lot of reverse engineer work on CAN bus comms. So for those who are unfamiliar, we'll have a mini CAN bus primer right now. CAN bus is the uh, control system network that is inside your car. This is what allows the engine control unit, the ECU, um, the computer that controls the firing uh, of the engine, uh, and along with uh, brakes, uh, locks, like that type of thing, the, the vehicle is all one control network. And the pieces talk to each other. It's not really not unlike any other control network that you're all familiar with, which is, again, the parallels. Um, uh, and they did a whole lot of reverse engineering because each manufacturer has slightly different codes that they use, slightly different proprietary protocols or proprietary IDs and things. Uh, so there's a lot of reverse engineering work that goes into figuring out how cars work, how they talk to each other, uh, all the stuff that we've been talking about in this space and are familiar with. And what they did or were able to accomplish and the reason why it became uh, a really mainstream and why it was super sexy was uh, they were able to uh, gain c full control of a vehicle. Uh, they were using a couple, two different ones, I guess you saw in the picture. But the main one I think that was nice for them was the Prius, because the Prius had parking assist and anti-collision stuff, which means that there are safety critical control systems managing the physical orientation of the steering wheel. Uh, there are control systems that manage the brakes. So you're doing more drive-by-wire. And I think it's pretty clear that as we're going forward in the future, there's going to be even more and more drive-by-wire in these cars, which means that you're going to be relying on the control system network more. Uh, and as uh, research has shown, those control system networks are not good. 
Uh, because, again, parallels, uh, they are insecure by design. Nobody ever uh, thought that you would have hackers messing with your CAN bus, because the, the idea is just so foreign and ridiculous. But it turns out we kind of do have to care about that type of thing. Uh, and the primary feedback that they got uh, from the auto manufacturers was it's not really a big deal because, hey, you need to be plugged in to the car. You have to be physically on the control system network. Anybody heard something like that before? That sounds weird, right? <laughs> Who cares? You have to be on the network. OK, well, that's um, uh, historically, that's been the case. Uh, but the future invades. Uh, and it turns out that, hey, having your control system network data is pretty darn useful. Uh, you can do cool things on your, uh, with your business with that. You can make more money with your control system data. You can save a lot of man hours if from your house you can control your plant or monitor your plant. And it's the exact same uh, that we're looking at with these guys. Uh, so there are a lot of companies that want your car data. Uh, insurance companies, uh, Verizon, I don't know why Verizon wants your car data. That almost scares me more. Um, but it's clear why people want your car data. The insurance companies can, can take it, analyze it, to get you the best rate for you, so that if you're a really good driver, you don't have to subsidize Chris Sistrunk driving around Miami. Because <laughs> who wants to do that? Uh, and some people want more than your data. And uh, seriously, these guys are really messed up. Uh, like remote repo men. They want to be like, hey, you missed a payment, so you can't drive anymore. Uh, sorry. But not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. That's a hashtag, right? Uh, so this type of, there are companies who want your data, there are companies who want to remotely control your data, uh, remotely control your isolated control system. And so uh, we're seeing interconnectivity of these types of things. There's network connectivity to cars, there's network connectivity. Um, auto manufacturers are starting to put it directly in the engine. Uh, but the thing that uh, we're going to be looking at is related to the stuff we're talking about here, which you could kind of see in this picture. Uh, that little dongle down there, uh, and Progressive, uh, they have little embedded system dongles that you plug directly into your ODB2 port on your car. And this quote is pretty cool. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read it verbatim. Quite honestly, the vehicles and systems and components today are quite robust and resistant to cybersecurity threats. Uh, which I don't know if your reaction was similar to mine, but it was something like this. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> Because my experience dictates otherwise, uh, and the experience of colleagues that I know and trust uh, dictates otherwise. So uh, let's look at one. Let's just, I, I, you know, let's order one. Let's take a look. I don't know if it's hard to see in the back, but we're going to change flow to flaunt uh, and see if we can't uh, do something with these little dongles here. Uh, so the specific one that I looked at was Progressive's dongle. Uh, it could have been any company. Uh, I did not want to pick on them for any reason or another. It's just I signed up, and they give you a free trial. So uh, sure, that sounds great. I'll, I'll not buy something uh, and then take a look at it. So a real quick overview of how then the layout of the network and how Progressive cares about your data and what they want with it is uh, this is just a general high-level architecture overview. But the vehicle is the green guy there. And you have your CAN bus, which is your central bus that everything connects to. Uh, that's where your ECU is, your brakes, your park assist steering. And what they're doing is adding uh, a dongle right there, right directly on there. And anything on that bus can talk to anything else. There's no encryption on CAN bus. There's no authentication. Uh, so if you send a message that says, uh, brakes, turn on because I'm the anti-collision system and I totally think you're going to run into something, they'll do it. Uh, and there's no way to verify or anything. It is insecure by design which, again, in control systems, we're a little bit familiar with. So we're going to take that. We're going to use the GPRS cell modem to connect that to a carrier network that is outside of Progressive's control to go up to the Progressive network backend in this instance. And again, uh, actually, so I will say right now, uh, I, right before this talk, um, I was on the phone with Progressive. So the nice thing about reporters is they, know, they can get you in touch with the right people. Um, because a general email to uh, info at progressive.com doesn't always uh, end you up with a person. Um, so I have been in touch with them. Uh, we spoke for about 10 minutes very briefly before this. And, and they're super interested. They want to work together. So everything's cool on that realm. 
uh, and they care about security and they want to move forward. Just like all the vendors here, I don't think anybody says that they don't care about security. The trouble with security is it's a pain in the ass and you're selling a negative, so nobody wants to do it. Because um, it doesn't get you anything uh, except prevent something bad from happening, maybe. Uh, and anyway, back to, uh, back to the talk. So this is a general overview of their architecture. Uh, and a quick ODB2 primer. Uh, the ODB2 is OD, see I do that all the time, sorry, it's OBD. But for some reason in my head I get dyslexic about that. Onboard diagnostics port. Uh, and as of 1996, they are mandated in all vehicles in the United States. Uh, it is a diagnostics port that is probably, if you go home and look in your car, it's underneath your dash to the left, uh, just, a little, just a little port there. And that puts you directly on CAN bus. CAN bus is a two-wire uh, protocol, which some of you are going to be in our CAN bus hacking class tomorrow, so you'll get some hands-on first uh, direct experience messing with stuff, so it's going to be fun. Uh, anyway, so that's everywhere that diagnostic support is, which is why they can do, progressive can do something like, hey, everybody go ahead and plug this in and it works, uh, which is cool. And it's also mandatory in the EU. So we've, I got a dongle, signed up for progressive's trial. Uh, they sent some stuff out my way. And the first thing that I did was crack, cracked it open and take a look at some of the hardware. I, I also have the hardware here, so if afterwards you want to come check it out, uh, that'll be fun. You can come do that too. So my wife took this picture because she thought it was hilarious. Uh, compare and contrast this to the one uh, with those other guys in the sunny location out in the nice warm weather. And this is Idaho. So this is what it's like if you want to hack cars in Idaho. you got to be uh, out in the cold. Uh, but that's OK. I was born in North Dakota. So uh, anyway, she thought it was funny that I was out there in the, at night in the winter uh, working on this truck. So that's, uh, that's the sacrificial <laughs> lamb volunteer vehicle. Uh, that I probably voided my warranty on. Don't tell Toyota. Um, uh, it's a 2013 Tundra is uh, the, the truck that I have. And that's what I was testing on. Uh, but here's what the, the dongle looks like. So it comes in a little plastic case. Uh, it's shaped like this. This is it cracked open front and back. Uh, and there's a little daughter board that sits on top for power reg. And then the embedded uh, board is on the bottom. And then you see an RF shield over the cell. So this, is, this next slide is the is the left picture with that shield uh, removed. So this is the cellular daughter board that they slap on there. That's an off-the-shelf. Uh, it's made by Ublocks, is the name of the company, uh, that makes that daughter board. So they put that on there. That's the cellular interface that they use uh, to communicate up. Uh, and then, so the first step was to go through and see what kind of hardware sits on the, on the system. And so you're identifying chips. I don't, I, I don't know if I can point at this stuff or not. Um, this, uh, this chip that's missing on the top left here where the letters are is, uh, um, that one is the CAN bus transceiver. So that's what does the electro EE stuff to get that working. Um, then there's this chip in the bottom left. That's a, a CAN bus bootloader. Um, because if your car's not on, it doesn't want to be awake. Um, even though you have a car battery there, which provides you with plenty of juice, I guess they don't want to run your battery down. So that's nice. Uh, and then the main CPU, which is an Atmel uh, arm. Uh, and then the one that's missing in the very right uh, is uh, that's the flash chip. So it's missing because with the help of Robert Urbis, who's now at IOActive, uh, he's a good friend, uh, we pulled that chip off. He threw it in a chip reader and pulled the firmware for me because uh, I didn't have a chip reader. So to get the firmware off of this thing, uh, we, I, I just yanked the flash and pulled the firmware off the flash. Uh, you'll also notice these pads on the right here. That's JTAG, uh, so that could have worked as well. Um, and then here's uh, a BeagleBone. So those of you who are coming to the class, you're going to get one of these when you go home. Uh, this is a BeagleBone with a CAN bus cape. Uh, and so here's my uh, wiring job to monitor the CAN bus uh, side of, of what this dongle does. Um, that's just a picture of it plugged up. I think I have a better picture on the other side, but um, these wires here are hooked up to a Salia logic a Cilia or Salia, I don't know how you pronounce that actually, uh, logic analyzer. Um, and these are the I.O. pins to the cell daughter board. Uh, so I could watch the UART and see what the firmware was sending, uh, what, what the AT commands and stuff like that was uh, to the cell. And I got a bunch of them because I am not good at soldering. <laughs> um, and they melted. Uh, but they're free. 
Uh, unless you don't send them back, then you got to pay $50. So read up, you got an expense report coming. Because um, I didn't send any back. <clears throat> so uh, that was the hardware analysis. Uh, moving on, so once we pull the firmware off, then you get into the firmware analysis side of things. Um, so my favorite tool out of all tools almost is strings. I think strings is, if you're not going to have any other tool, strings is awesome for forensics and, and firmware analysis. So you can't read this, but that's okay, because the next slide I've got the, some of the more interesting strings uh, just to highlight. Um, you can see this, uh, there's a full directory path uh, a couple places in there. Um, which gives you some hints as to who the manufacturer is, uh, what, the, what the project, I, I think Ocarina might be a pro, uh, code name for the project, I'm not sure. Um, but this development shop is based in Minnesota. Uh, if you also go to the Zergotech website, which is the manufacturer of the dongle, uh, all that checks out. Um, they have some URLs in there. Uh, anybody can do some who is on this uh, domain. Uh, this URL is not accessible uh, from the internet. Uh, because this is on the GPRS side of things. Uh, and the GPRS provider string is that, which we'll see in a second. And just stuff like uh, dealing with a cellular modem. Uh, and then also for firmware analysis, uh, of course, you've got IDA. Uh, and the thing that you, that you use IDA for in a case like this is looking for dangerous execution patterns uh, using awesome libraries like Eyeball to, uh, there you go, plug read to get uh, firmware analysis to see if you can identify what kind of things the firmware is doing. So if you can identify uh, potential uh, coding issues in there. Uh, and then the cellular UR dumps were really cool to look through all the AT commands that, uh, the cell, that it sends to the cell modem. Um, the one that I have highlighted here, uh, I took an excerpt to explain it from the manual. Uh, but so the AT command is you've got the profile uh, and then a tag and a value. So you see the command is 160, so profile 1, we're going to set number 6, and we're going to set it to 0. So uh, there's no authentication to the cellular uh, network, as an example. So the future work, uh, to extend what I did, I will say that uh, weaponization uh, or controlling the vehicle wasn't the goal of this project. The goal was to identify what kind of, what, what's the security posture almost more than anything uh, what kind of vulnerabilities are present in these types of devices? Uh, because it's a very similar thing that we're seeing third-party devices being plugged into ICS. Uh, what, what's their security posture? Because we're taking devices and we're putting them in insecure by design systems. So hopefully those devices are not also insecure by design and they actually start with security from the start. Um, and the future work on this is I didn't do any cellular man in the middle stuff. So if you're an open BTS nerd, uh, I want to be your friend. Um, I'll, I'll invite you to my birthday, and we can talk about um, open BTS cellular man in the middle stuff, because I think that's fun. Uh, another thing that would be kind of cool is to extend maybe Reed's library um, uh, for you super IDA pros getting flirt signatures. Uh, if you don't know what an IDA flirt signature is, it's a, a function fingerprint so that you can identify common libraries in stuff like firmware or in unknown binary goo. So that you can pick apart the stuff that they actually wrote. So I'd be interested in the things that Zergotech actually changed because the firmware is based on free RTOS. Uh, so in summary, uh, what, what I found in looking at this stuff is that there's not, unfortunately, there's uh, not validation or firmware signing, secure boot, sell off, as you saw with AT commands. Um, no secure communications, there's FTP uh, for communicating. Uh, basically, there's no modern, uh, maybe that should say modern, mo no modern security technologies that are present. Uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't take advantage of all of the massive strides that we've accomplished in the past uh, five to ten years, um, which maybe is not a surprise to everybody in this room because embedded developers just don't. Uh, just don't do that stuff. because you for a lot of reasons, uh, which I guess uh, everybody's tired of hearing, so we don't have to go into that. Uh, but it, it, I mean, this is not unexpected, right? So basically, the oh really slide was, are you sure about that? Because that's not what we've seen. Let's tear it open. We tore it open. Uh, and yeah, suspicions are basically confirmed uh, that, uh, that the security posture has not changed uh, with these third parties that are taking and plugging in connectivity to the ICS systems. So. <clears throat> 
The potential impact, and this is where we, everybody aboard the FUD train, because um, uh, this will be the part that, that hits that. Uh, so what's the potential impact uh, if the device is vulnerable? If you've got, if you now have an isolated control system that you know is vulnerable and won't ever be patched, uh, and now you're taking a third party device and bridging that to some global network, uh, what happens if that device is vulnerable? Uh, what happens if the carrier or the communications that you use to send your data, what if that's vulnerable? Uh, which, as we've seen uh, in lots of research lately, especially with SDRs getting cheaper, uh, cellular communications are not uh, just for nation state attackers anymore. Um, and that's why I want to make friends with some uh, cellular people. Um, and what happens also if the infrastructure is compromised, uh, e.g., in this case, progressive servers? What if, uh, what if the firmware shop is compromised? What if you have con remote control of these types of devices? Well, someday this is going to be me. <laughs> Pull up to a crowded street and do the Bruce Almighty thing. Anybody seen that movie? Car's out of my way. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the dream. Uh, but uh, there's, a, there's a pretty good book. It's a techno thriller. Uh, Daniel Suarez, the, De the Damon, uh, is actually maybe not that far out there. Because uh, in there, there are uh, vehicle armies um, where you control swarms of vehicles that go out and do your bidding. Uh, the other aspects that are, are possible, um, you have to think about privacy, uh, data in integrity, and, and protecting your customer's data when you're using insecure communication protocols. Uh, it's easy to leak data. Um, and the big one is uh, a, sort of an extension of being able to remotely control a vehicle is, is remote and untraceable assassination possible. Um, if you can remotely control something like this dongle uh, and somebody's driving on the road at 80 miles an hour and you give the CAN bus commands to lock the right brakes and go ahead and crank that steering wheel, uh, now it looks like there's a car accident. Um, and does anybody investigate that? Are there black boxes on vehicles? Not really. Uh, there's a quick hi there to Anthony per Percy because we had, a, we had a fun discussion about what the threat is. So I'm not really a threat guy, uh, and he's really passionate about threat. So just walk by him and say, hey, uh, threat, what do you think about that? And he'll start talking to you. Uh, but we, we had an interesting discussion, so maybe this can be some discussion as you're going forward with your friends. Like, what is this, how much FUD is there, and how much do, should we actually kind of is this maybe a problem? Uh, defense for this types of thing uh, is maybe perhaps the best part to this whole thing, because you remember that 1996 year? So something like this, you're good to go. So everybody go out, tell your uh, spouse uh, that you need to buy a classic car uh, for sa your own safety. Um, <laughs> and, and there's no argument. Uh, uh, but in, in reality, you, you need to be careful uh, what you're plugging into your buses. Uh, you need to be careful what you're plugging into your SCADA systems. Uh, if you've got a third-party solution from somebody, what is their security posture? Uh, are you just introducing more complexity and more attack vectors into your system? So we talk about isolation, but in reality, there's third-party stuff, and there are people who want to connect networks. And I think that that's unavoidable moving forward. So really, we also need the vendors to jump on board this and, uh, and, and st start working in uh, security and getting rid of insecure by design. Start from the ground up. Uh, in terms of how you could maybe improve the design of this specific system is to separate the CAN bus uh, actions from the general firmware of the system. Uh, this, you, you should never need to, so on CAN bus you have to write to, write to the CAN bus to get some of the diagnostics. Uh, but that piece shouldn't ever need to, you, you, wouldn't, you know what commands you need to write. Uh, and they're only diagnostics commands, which people in the class tomorrow are going to learn. You don't have to write, hey, breaks, go ahead and engage uh, right now. That's never a thing uh, if you're a progressive dongle that you need to do. So limiting that type of thing and maybe having some type of serial interface or whatever between your dongle firmware uh, that collects the data, compiles it, sends it up, and the actual little bitty piece uh, that talks to the CAN bus uh, and, and maybe have a one-way communication between the two. That might be a good idea. Uh, so the conclusions, I think, from, from just my analysis uh, were pretty much the same as, I, as, I, as expected. Uh, so I'm unhappy to say that that looks like that's the case. Uh, third parties are attaching insecure by design systems. 
to the cloud slash net slash Borg, uh, and they're doing this poorly. Um, the hope, I guess, is that we, we take modern security technologies, uh, uh, encryption, authentication, and, and use those moving forward. And I think vendors have to care, because I don't think isolation is going to hold. Um, it's uh, progressive just mails these things out, and, and often your users don't think about it. Uh, and some of your more educated users might, uh, but it, it, I think it's also on a similar scale. Like there's progressive uh, users who will just plug whatever in. There's some people who wouldn't. Um, and there are vendors, uh, like customers of Siemens who will do whatever, and some who are more educated. But uh, I think vendors do have to care. You can't just uh, raise the isolation flag and, and hope that holds. So that's the end of the presentation. If you want to come check out the hardware, uh, that, that would be awesome. Uh, I'll show it to you. You can come look at stuff. Uh, and are there any questions? We have one back here. Uh, Andrew Ginter from, from Waterfall. This is a, a, a question near and dear to my heart, um, but I'm not an expert in the field. And so things I worry about, um, you've talked about you know, connecting up to the cellular network and um, stuff inside. What a lot of people are talking about in the next five to ten years is wireless stuff built into cars by design, not mm -hmm. add-ons, mm -hmm. by design, because they're going to be taking uh, signals from the car in front of them to do slipstreaming, or because they are going to be taking signals from roadside devices or even other cars just to understand the, the general uh, physical environment and the, you know, in a sense, the automotive threat environment. Um, but um, hobbyists are going to modify their own cars. They do this all the time. Hackers are going to modify the roadside devices. They do this kind of thing all the time. Um, in what sense is it safe to trust anything that you receive wirelessly. Well, yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, and I think that's where the vendors and the manufacturers of these things, uh, and something that Adam Crane has been really pushing is, uh, you, you gotta identify your ins and outs to your code, uh, and, and you have to care about those. In this particular instance, the CAN bus dongle has an in out of the CAN bus, uh, and the cellular modem, uh, and then the data that's transferred over the cellular modem. Those are the attack vectors. So really, you should focus on that. Uh, and if you've got some internal function that might be vulnerable, it's probably less important than, than focusing on that specific, uh, excuse me, specifically. But yeah, it, I mean, Internet of Things, right? Uh, awesomest uh, term. Uh, that's, there's just wireless going to be everywhere. So we got to start making sure that that's secure from the get-go. Hi, Corey. Hi. Great presentation. Um, this is not really a question, but I thought you and the rest of the room would be interested. Um, Daimler has been offering a privacy scrubbing service for cars for a number oh. of years. Um, so there are a few companies out there thinking about some of these things. Okay, yeah, they still have a, you know, problems that they're trying to solve as well, but I just think that's interesting that they are willing to take a car that you have owned for a number of years and uh, scrub the data for the next um, user of the car, yep. um, but not a lot of people are using that service. So it would be interesting if people in the room would, would ask other vendors if they offer such services. That's, yeah, that's really cool. I hadn't heard about that. That's awesome. Uh, moving forward, though, uh, it'd be curious to see whether that works in the future, because autos are, uh, everybody wants DRM. Like, if, uh, if you have to buy Toyota brake pads to stick in a Toyota because there's an encryption key and only, so there's, a, there's an evil side to this whole moving forward securely. Uh, so if you have DRM everywhere, then that could also be a problem. So maybe, I don't know, maybe stick with the classic cars. That's probably the safest, uh, the safest thing to do. But yeah, that's really cool, uh, being able to do that. We have a question over on this side. Hey, Corey. Hey. Um, Tim Yardley, University of Illinois. So there's, there's been a number of, of people that have done um, car hacking, per se, over time. You, you've mentioned um, uh, Charlie and, and such, um, and Stephen Savage is another on the, on the academic side that did some work at, when he was at UW and now at UCSD. Um, and I think it's interesting. You know, CAN buses, it was meant as a diagnostic port. It right. was meant for mechanics originally, right? And 
Um, but when you start, so to the question, when you start seeing the um, autonomous vehicles, when you start seeing the, the smarter, you know, computerized vehicles like the Teslas, for instance, they're receiving things like full car firmware updates yeah. over the air, and, uh, and they have a built-in USB port that allows you, well, kind of a USB port, that allows you to just connect up a computer and do diagnostics and stuff like that. So moving forward, I think the, the you know, uh, entry vector per se to doing car hacking changes. Um, you know, Bluetooth is one way to actually hack a lot of cars today because Bluetooth is connected to CAN bus as well. But how do you see that changing the dynamic of, of implication of, of these coming forward? So for instance, autonomous vehicles driving down the road a la CES with the Audi RS6 or whatever it was that drove 500 miles to, to Vegas. Um, how do you see that, uh, that playing out? Are people gonna start um, looking at uh, vehicles as weapons? Um, or, you know, or is this something that, that I mean, it, it's a different paradigm than traditional ICS, right? Because right. these are things that are moving all the time, not just, right. oh, I can turn off the power. Yeah, and that's, uh, yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, I'll make one quick point and then I think I'm probably out of time. Um, to that is it's really, it's really that, that gets into the FUD territory about that Daniel Suarez book is pretty awesome. But it's basically that, like, you know, there's automated cars uh, and they have vulnerabilities in them, uh, just like all the other systems. So being taken over and then, yeah, now you've got an army of 4,000 pound machines that you can get to go anywhere. Except it's an awesome book, so of course the machines have swords on them and stuff like that. Uh, but um, but it, I will say that moving forward, like there are, uh, Brian um, Owens was uh, uh, really pushing Tesla uh, yes, yesterday when I was talking to him about it, or Monday, which is kind of funny. But there are vehicle manufacturers who are going forward and hopefully incorporating newer technology. Uh, I just really want security to get in there too. And I know, um, I can't say who or where, but there are vehicle uh, companies who are engaging uh, uh, external QA or external security people, same thing, um, to help them make sure that, that uh, uh, the system, so my fa new favorite quote was from SPAF at, uh, at ICS JWG was the first time I heard it. A system is good if it does what it's supposed to do and it's secure if it doesn't do anything else. And I think that that really sums up exactly what we're trying to do. So we need security people to help that make sure that it doesn't do anything else uh, part. And if it can do awesome stuff like drive itself, hey, I'm all for that. I don't want to drive in. Kind of sucks unless you have awesome green Mustangs. Uh, but this trunk will let me drive it. So that, yeah, I think I'm out of time. So that's all I got. Come check out the hardware. Uh, and I appreciate your interest. <laughs>